In the last episode, we looked at the best-selling console of the 1990s, the Sony PlayStation, that revolutionized the market. It's no wonder that Sony did it again with the release of their PlayStation 2 in the new millennia. The PlayStation 2 was first released in Japan on March 4, 2000. The North American release followed on October 26, in Europe on November 24, and in Australia on November 30th of the same year. There are over 4,000 games available for the PlayStation 2 when combining the Japanese, Europe, and North American titles. Even with the release of its successor, the PS3, in 2006, the PS2 was manufactured until the end of 2012 and repair services in Japan were offered until September 2018. The console totaled sales of over 155 million units, making it the best-selling video game console of all time. Some of the factors that contributed to making the PlayStation 2 so successful was its use of a custom-designed Emotion Engine CPU with a floating point performance of 6.2 gigaflops and a custom-designed GPU that was capable of delivering up to 75 million polygons per second. In addition, the console is backward compatible with most of the original PlayStation game as its onboard ILP chip is a duplicate of the original PS1 CPU. And, third-party developers continued to make game titles like Final Fantasy X exclusive to the PS2. Other popular titles offered exclusively on the PS2 were Metal Gear Solid and Ratchet and & Clank. But the PS2 was much more than just a game console. It was also a CD player, karaoke machine, and DVD player. And with an optional remote control, you could easily integrate it into your home theater or family room as your main player. The PS2 offered many accessories like the iToy, memory cards and microphones and many more. It also allowed for third-party components such as a standard PC keyboard and mouse to connect via its USB ports. It also had the possibility of connecting an internal or external hard drive for game installation, game saves and to download new content. The PS2 saw 18 hardware revisions and 13 models throughout its lifespan, but the most significant change came about with the redesigned version. The reduced size was mostly achieved by offloading the power supply to an external one and removing support for the hard disk drive. It also removed the PS1 CPU and RAM and instead emulated the PS1. This was achieved by overclocking both the CPU and the GPU. The new version came to be known as the PS2 Slim and the old one as the PS2 Fat. The new Slim also included an integrated network adapter that was an add-on to the original PS2 and sold as a module that plugged in the back of the console. And while the new reduced size and lesser chance of overheating because of the power supply not being external has its appeal, in fact, the overclocking of the chips could incur more heat which is intensified by the Slim's lack of ventilation. Many prefer the PS2 fat version for its native PS1 game support, front-loading CD, HD support and overall robustness. But no matter the version, the PS2 is still a sought-after console with some of the most outstanding titles brought to home entertainment that paved the way to the future. Stick around and watch me take a PS2 fat apart, restore it, and give it a new life. Hello everyone and welcome. I'm the Retro Repair Guy. Thank you and welcome to all the new subscribers. And I really want to apologize for the delay in releasing this video. I was dealing for 15 days back and forth emails uh, with two companies in Korea who had some false copyright claims on my video and uh, videos, I should say, with an S, a uh, couple of them. And I was very, very upset because, you know, since I started this channel in the beginning, I've only been on the up and up. My goal is to monetize this channel and to try to bring you something of professional value, um, something good that, you know, there's. I don't steal material from people. And if I borrow a picture, I email somebody or a screenshot. I try to email everyone, tell them, listen, can I use this? If not, I use something in the, uh, you know, um, what do they call it? The free in the commons uh, stuff like Wikipedia, for example. Um, I've used stuff from Pixabay that's free for commercial use. Uh, but I've been very careful in everything, okay? And I license everything and I pay out of my pocket every month and make a big fat zero with this. So the thing is, is that um, they had put this false copyright claim on it. I subscribe for my music. I, I think it's very important to have music for my channel. Um, and especially when I do demos or anything like that, let's say I, I fix something and I want to show. So the last thing I would want is a copyright claim. So I subscribe to a, uh, a place like called Soundstripe. Okay. And their services, you pay per month and they own hundred percent copyright of this music. You license it out for all of your videos. Now this is working out well, and apparently they own hundred percent copyright. This company came in and says, no, 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 we actually own the copyright. 
And so that's a dispute between them, but unfortunately I'm caught in the middle. And the problem that happens is the way that the YouTube um, you know, machine works, if you want, is that if I dispute it, and they come back and they say, no, 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 he's lying. It's uh, We really do own it. YouTube doesn't care. Strike. And if you have a strike, you can't monetize your channel. After three strikes, they erase your, your whole entire channel. You're just gone. So, you know, I'm working really hard here and I'm on the up and up. And so it was just very, very frustrating to get that. And I refused to release any more videos until this was clear because I didn't want any more problems. So anyways, that's dealt with. It's behind me now. I just wanted to explain what happened. It's a very frustrating situation to be in, uh, even for a small channel like me who just started out. And, and you know, I'm very careful about everything. And uh, anyways, so anyways, it's behind me. Uh, today I'm bringing you a beautiful PS2 and I figured it'd be a perfect follow-up from the last episode uh, where I had a PS1. So beautiful, uh, you know, follow-up PS2, beautiful machine, a bit of a rough, rough shape when I opened it up. So let's dive in and go take a look. For some strange reason, the AV port on the PS2 is riddled with rust, but I want to quickly test the unit to see what shape it's in. Simply plugging it in causes a buzz in the TV speakers. When I turn it on, the buzz seems less intense and while you can't really see it on camera, there are little lines going across the screen horizontally. The good news, however, is that I hear the boot up screen through the buzz. The CD opens and closes fine, but I'm obviously not going to try any games since I can't see anything on the screen. These tests annoy me, so let's just go ahead and open it up.
Before starting to recap the board, I'm brushing off some of the dirt. The pump removed most of the solder, but I still have to pull on them a bit from the other side of the board. This particular power supply that's in the SCPH50010 has four 680 microfarad capacitors and one of 470. Both are 16 volts. Luckily, I have those on hand, so I removed them all in one shot and replaced them right away. The new ones are a little bit longer, but will still fit without any problems on the board. I'm recapping the power supply with Nishikan capacitors rated at 105 degrees, and of course, resoldering them all at the same time, which is making recapping this board really easy and taking me about 10 minutes. The larger capacitor is 330 microfarads rated at 315 volts, so I had to order that one, but it came at my door in only 24 hours. The old one was glued to the board, so I pried it off. Even though the new one was of the exact same value, strangely, this time it was a little bit larger than the old one, but it still fit on the board. I simply had to straighten the legs a little bit with the pliers, and I applied hot glue underneath and at the top. I will say that there is better glue out there for this kind of application, but it's also much more expensive and I'm using heavy duty glue sticks. And of course, when I was finished, I realized there were two other tiny capacitors I hadn't seen of 22 and 33 microfarads, so I went ahead and changed those as well. Because the unit has so much rust, I'm thinking it might have had water damage or something, so I'm opening up the network adapter so I can clean it thoroughly and inspect how far the rust has got in. Luckily it doesn't seem that bad, however it will still allow me to clean the boards with alcohol and clean the casing in the sink and brush some of the rust off the shield. As for the DVD player, dismantling it will not only allow me to clean the casing and laser assembly properly, but perform some preventative maintenance on it like changing the 20 year old belt that opens and closes the tray. The belt can only be accessed by completely removing the tray and then removing the plastic cover over the gears. I'm matching the belt as close as possible, but I choose one that is just a hair smaller to account for some slack that would have occurred over the last 20 years from the rubber. There's a lot of dirt and old grease stuck in the grooves of the spindle, so I'm going to remove the tiny arm guiding the laser, clean it up, and put some fresh white grease on it.
So as you saw, this unit is pretty rusty. Um, rust got in everywhere in the AV port, and the AV port is probably what was causing um, the buzz uh, that we saw in the testing at the beginning and stuff. Now, um, that was one of my reasons as well to want to throw it in the dishwasher. How it got so rusty, I have no idea. My best guess I was thinking that since it came from the thrift store now, on the side they have the door for the donations, and every time um, that they're closed, people leave stuff outside as like a lineup of, of stuff you know in bags and uh, that people leave so i'm thinking maybe somebody left it there it rained on it or something because how does rust get into the av port and everywhere else around unless it was immersed in the water or something so anyways that's my best guess uh however that was like i said the choice of why i put it in a dishwasher with the anti-corrosive soap but also uh the vinegar the vinegar dissolved it beautifully uh, all, all of the uh, rust. I helped it out with a little brush and of course put some contact cleaner to make sure there's no residue of anything. And it came out beautiful, so hopefully it'll stay like that. And I can't wait to test it out.
So as we see, the hum is completely gone. It turns on and I'm getting an image, uh, fantastic. And so far, so good. The DVD seems to be loading without any problems. This is a normal screen where I'm getting uh, an error because I don't have a memory card, so it's telling me that uh, I can't save the game. And everything seems to be working smoothly. Gameplay is fine. And, uh, well, beautiful. I can't wait to actually play. Well, lucky me, I just got 28 games donated to me about three weeks ago for the PS2. Uh, that This nice big bin here, I don't know if you could see it all. Uh, but anyways, I got I got Deer Hunter, I got some NHL games, uh, No One Lives Forever. I've got uh, Romance 7, I got, 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 got uh, The Mark of Cree, the NFL Blitz, Fight Night 2004, Fight Club, Hitman, uh, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six. I've got Ghost Recon, Getaway, <laughs> Medieval, uh, excuse me, Medieval, Medal of Honor. Don't, it's my eyes, okay? I can't see. So Medal of Honor, The Punisher, Red Faction uh, 2, True Crimes, uh, Killzone, Metal Gear Solid 2, SOCOM, uh, Gran Turismo, Prince of Persia, another Gran Turismo. Uh, I've got, what else have I got here aside from that? Well, Final Fantasy. Uh, Final Fantasy uh, 10 2. I guess this is part 2 because it was Final Fantasy 10. Uh, and I've got, of course, uh, Prince of Persia, Warrior Within, uh, God of War, and another Prince of Persia, The Two Thrones. So 28 games donated. I do have a few myself as well um, in my collection somewhere. Uh, so very happy. I can't wait to play some of these. Uh, I'm just running out of space. I don't know where to put all this stuff. Like, I really have no idea, and I really want to play. So I got to figure it out. But anyways, um, please leave me your comments in the comment section. Let me know uh, what you want to see, what you want to see me fix, uh, what do you want to see me less of, more of, because I really want to bring you something uh, professional here. And I want to do the best that I can, uh, make you happy, keep you and uh, sub you know keep you subscribed. And please share my channel with anybody you think might be interested in seeing these shows. Uh, because my goal is to really uh, try to monetize this channel to, you know, uh, I need more subscribers and I'm still, like I said, uh, out of pocket here. So, um, you know, anything helps. Like I said, just, you know, subscribe if you want to subscribe also to Patreon or anything like that. 
Um, the links are all in the description. I don't like to push people and ask for these things. I'm just saying, you know, at least subscribe and hit the notification. These are free things and share the channel with someone else. These are just things that are going to help me get more subscribers. But either way, I hope you like the show and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys, uh, well, soon, hopefully next week. Bye-bye.